Good evening and welcome to another episode of Shire TV. I'm James Cleveland. And I'm Darrell W. Perry. In 2011, Thomas Ball performed what some might call the greatest form of protest. After years of battling the New Hampshire judicial system and losing everything he had, Ball decided the only and last form of recourse was to self-immolate on the front steps of the Cheshire County Superior Court. Now, nearly two years later, New Hampshire State Rep Stella Trimbley is attempting to pass a bill that would help protect families from having to go through the same process by actually implementing some of the measures that Ball highlighted in his suicide note. However, due to some bad communications, the bill was removed from the table. Here's video from Dave Ridley. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm sitting here with, uh, with Stella Trimbley, uh, state rep from uh, Rockingham County, uh, and you had something interesting to tell me that apparently something happened when you tried to submit a bill that would, uh, that would uh, take some action in response to Thomas Ball's self-immolation. Uh, and you said the bill was just quashed or something kind of weird happened with the bill, tell me. Well, um, apparently I was out of town. When I came back, um, I, had a, I went down to the legislative office twice and ask, is there any bills that I pick up? And they said, no, there isn't. I mean, so then I, uh, the next thing I know, mm -hmm. the bill um, was removed. And I said, why? And uh, at the hearing, I went to the Rules Committee hearing. I said it was already, they had given an HB number, but because I hadn't gone down in time to sign off on it, it's gone. So I will what, follow up on it. What was the wording of the bill? What was it? The wording of the bill, I took Thomas J. Ball's letter that he wrote before he committed suicide and took the points that he made. For example, if judges could instruct the people in front of them at family court, say, I know you can't stand each other right now, but do you realize the hardship you're going to go through? You're going to, the statistics are you're going to be homeless. Mm -hmm. You're going to have double bills. If you couldn't make it on your payment now and you're stressed financially, what's going to end up is that you're going to have even more stress. You're going to have to have two bills, two electricity, et cetera, et cetera. And Thomas J. Ball was very thorough. Well, we're going to memorialize Tom's death. He made a sacrifice for the Father's Rights Movement. Uh, coincidentally, he's the fourth guy I've known of in the Fatherhood Coalition that have committed suicide since 1994. Well, this is not a man who was completely, you know, distraught. It was an unjust system. Mm -hmm. He wrote, and I took whatever was on his letter, and that's what I put in the bill. I see. And then the bill just disappeared. No, it did disappear. It just said it didn't go through because I... On a technicality, I had not handed it in on time. I see. Signed off. So you're on. not saying that they failed to follow procedure properly. You're saying you failed to follow procedure properly. Well, when you go down to the legislative office and say, are there any bills that I have to sign off? And I'd been there at least oh, three times. Oh, okay. They said there's nothing. I see. Now, I only found out that it was pulled by one of the attorneys when I went, and I think it's Jill Saifking, 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 anyways, it's Jill. Yeah. And she showed up at the Rules Committee hearing, and she's the one that said, oh, we had to pull it because we tried on numerous occasions to contact Representative Tremblay, and she didn't sign off on it in time. And is there anyone in specific that you blame for this happening, or? I think it was a miscommunication. Mm. Um, I guess next time I go down, I have to say, are you positive? Are you mm. sure? I haven't signed off on this, this, and that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, but thank it's going to be brought. Uh, it's going to be brought. I, I never support bill wording until I've read the whole thing, but I appreciate you following up on that sacrifice that he made. Well, he, it's got to keep alive because there's uh, over 100,000 men committing suicide Yeah. because of the unjust systems. Most men want to take care of their family, want to take care of their, ch their yeah. children, but they want visitation, they want justice. Are you proud of yourself, Fredrickson? Hmm? He, purposely you blocked your he purposely blocked your shot. He purposely blocked your shot. That's an old you tactic. guys escalate this stuff at every turn, and you end up with people burning themselves in front of your building. You're part of that. 
What's wrong with you, man? Think about your actions. Yeah. You know, if a father has proved that, you know, that he is not abusive or any of those things, then he should have the ability to take uh, to see his children. It's in law that fathers and are really important. Ask anyone. Ask a child. Yeah. So. All right, Stella. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Now, this is very interesting for a number of reasons. First, because basically there was the legislative snafu, or whatever you want to call it, where the state rep filed a bill and went numerous times to the legislative service office and asked, do I have any bills that I need to sign off on? Because here in New Hampshire, they pre-file the bills, and then it gets, you know, some uh, wording is changed and made sure that it follows the proper format. And then the state rep has to, or state senator, has to then sign off saying, yes, you know, this is what I want introduced. So she went numerous times and asked, do I have anything to sign? And they repeatedly said no. And then they informed her, we pulled your bill because you didn't sign it. Yeah, and that's uh, really interesting. It doesn't seem like a coincidence that, you know, something very sensitive like this would just magically, the, the system will fail and we're not even gonna be able to address the issue. And I know that um, when this occurred, there was almost like a cover-up uh, for media about this event. Like, it's like they, the state did not want uh, you know, people to know what happened. Right, because governments don't like for people to know when they screw up. And this is something more than just a government screw up. This is just blatant disregard for the rights of a segment of the population. There are a lot of fathers that would love to be able to see their children, but due to court snafus, if you will, or just outright uh, corruption in the way they do some of their procedures, some men do not ever get that chance to see their children. And unfortunately, every now and then it comes down to where the man feels helpless and the only thing that he can do is to take his own life. And it's really, really sad. Georgia senators recently passed a resolution to move the state's northern border in order to gain water access to the Tennessee River, according to an article by timesfreepress.com. Georgia House Resolution 4 proposes a settlement of the boundary dispute based on 200-year-old survey errors clarifying Georgia's access to Tennessee River water. It directs the state attorney general to sue to gain control of the entire area south of the 35th parallel if no agreement is reached with Tennessee. The Tennessee Valley Authority has identified the Tennessee River as a likely source of water for North Georgia, said Senator David Schaefer, but the TVA, which is responsible for approving interbasin water transfer from the Tennessee River, says it has not recommended using the river as a primary source of water for North Georgia. We aren't certain where Senator Schaefer got his information. We are not involved in the discussion at this point, said TVA spokesman Scott Brooks. The resolution passed 48 to 2 and now goes back to the House for agreement on amendments made by the Senate. Yeah, I guess this will be uh, interesting to see what happens. You know, I, I seriously doubt that, you know, the border is going to change. Uh, However, water rights are a big problem down there. Yeah, you're from Georgia, so you know a lot about you know, what's going on. And this is something that it's not new. It's been going on for years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a real big issue down there where basically the, the Army Corps of Engineers, you know, they, I guess they, they force Georgia to uh, give water to other states and then there's a huge problem with there's not enough water. So this is why that, you know, they're taking measures such as this to, you know, try to secure more water for the state. Well, I'm not so sure that it's necessarily that Georgia is having to give water to other states. It's that 
the rivers, the major rivers that flow through Georgia actually don't flow through Georgia. They're the borders. The Chattahoochee is the border between Alabama and Georgia, and then the Savannah River is the Georgia-South Carolina border. So all of the major rivers are shared with another state. So the water rights from those rivers are shared. So that's... One yeah, that's the reason. A, so it's not necessarily that water is being taken from Georgia. It's that all of the water is shared with other states to begin with. And that's a fair point, but there are a few lakes uh, that other states claim access to the water rights. And then the uh, my understanding is the, the Corps of Engineers, like, you know, they handle these disputes and they try to uh, distribute the water based on some kind of basis. I'm not exactly sure, but... Yeah, and I also find it interesting that this border dispute between Georgia and Tennessee goes back at least 200 years <laughs> to where it was designated that the 35th parallel would be the border, but when it went out to get surveyed, somebody was off by about a mile and a half. So that was something that's never been resolved in nearly 200 years. <laughs> and hopefully it gets resolved sooner rather than later. Former police Philly Lieutenant Jonathan Josie, who was accused of striking a woman in the face and caught red-handed on video, was found not guilty in late February of this year. This outrageous decision is just one more example among thousands every year of the corrupt backdoor dealings being practiced by law enforcement officers across the country. Badges do not grant extra rights. Officers like Jonathan Josie and Judge Patrick Dugan, who handled the, who handed down the not guilty verdict, clearly believe otherwise. But the big story on Action News tonight is a not guilty verdict in the case of former Philadelphia Police Lieutenant Jonathan Josie. This is the video that got everybody's attention when it appeared Josie punched a woman. That during a raucous street party after the Puerto Rican Day Parade. Today a judge said Josie was not guilty of simple assault. Action News reporter Vernon Odom is live at police headquarters with the full story. Vernon? Jim, tonight, Aida Guzman's lawyer says the lady from Chester was essentially punched again here in the city of Philadelphia today. The police commissioner basically agrees and will fight efforts by the highly decorated 19-year police veteran to get his job back. Jonathan Josie cried when the not guilty verdict was announced, just as he did on the witness stand two weeks ago when he denied this smackdown of Aida Guzman was intended to injure her. He said he was trying to knock a beer bottle from her hand as he moved in for an arrest at the chaotic post-Puerto Rican Day Parade party in North Philadelphia. Josie now wants his job back. The video was shocking, um, you know, but in the long run, you know, acting in the scope of my duties, um, I in no way had any intentions on, on striking Ms. Guzman. We're thrilled uh, that this court, a fair-minded judge, took the opportunity to carefully review and evaluate the evidence, the credibility of the witnesses. From the start, Aida Guzman denied throwing beer at police as they were arresting a reckless driver at 5th and Lehigh. She said the not guilty verdict was predictable and unjust. Judge Patrick Dugan called the video disturbing, but blamed the news media for sensationalism and went ahead with a not guilty verdict. She did not get a fair shot today. End of story. And I'm not going to get into a why, but you guys know why. I've always said that we as a community have to um, trust and have faith in, in our judicial system. And messages like this uh, w with a uh, not guilty verdict sends the wrong message. Police work is not always pretty. And, uh, you know, um, that John Josie did exactly what he needed to do to control that situation. It was uncalled for, unprofessional. And uh, supervisors, lieutenants uh, and above, um, all supervisors, they're there to uh, maintain order, not to lose control. Jim, tonight, Ida Guzman's lawyer says he'll be filing a number of civil lawsuits on her behalf, including one in the federal court system claiming her civil rights were violated by Jonathan Josie and the city of Philadelphia. Live at police headquarters in Center City. Vernon Odom, Channel 6 Action News. Thank you, Vernon. Now, I think that the, the video tells the whole story. I mean, the officer claims that he thought that uh, she had thrown beer on him, but she hadn't. But if you had spilled your beer on someone and then you went 
or someone else spilled a beer on you and then you went and punched them, like I guarantee you, you'd be found guilty. All you have to do is say, I was trying to knock the beer bottle <laughs> out of their hand, but clearly you can see in the video that the punch that he threw was nowhere near her hand. It was nowhere near a beer bottle that I couldn't even tell if she was holding one. But it's just, it's blatant police abuse, and that's why he was fired. So at least the Philadelphia police did the right thing and fired this guy. Yeah, but there's, there's a chance now that he will be reinstated and continue working as a police officer, unfortunately. Well, there's a chance, even if he was found guilty, that some other police department would hire him. Because mm -hmm. you see these stories all the time across the country where people do things, get fired from one job, get found guilty of police misconduct, and all these other things, but still wind up getting hired. Yeah, and that's a great point. I mean, if, if you saw that punch, it was like very hard blow to the face, and she was bleeding after it. I mean, the idea that he was trying to knock the beer can out of her or beer bottle out of the hand, that is completely ridiculous. And even if he was <laughs> trying to knock the beer bottle out of her hand, and accidentally punched her in the face, that was still not in any way justified. And the use of force that he used was in no way proportional to any supposed use of force that she committed against him. She was pretty much you know, walking near where he was. He thought she threw beer. There's a lot of ways that a big guy like Jonathan Josie could have handled a smaller woman like that to control her or whatever it is that he was trying to do by punching her in the face. His response or his retaliation was totally unjustified, and I'm glad he got fired and hopefully he never works in law enforcement again, but he'll probably wind up getting a security job somewhere for one of these security companies and if he does that as a private security guard he will definitely get found guilty that's a great point in pittsburgh ice cream shop and coffee owner ethan clay upset with big banks and credit card companies has taken matters into his own hands and opened his own community bank despite the promise of heavy fines from pennsylvania banking regulators for doing so this local ice cream shop is getting some major national attention tonight and it has nothing to do with their ice cream. Yeah, you're going to love this story. Mm. The store's owner says he is fed up with big banks, and so he is starting his own. And that is causing huge headaches. Sheldon Ingram with the most unusual fight. We're inside of Oh Yeah Ice Cream and Waffles in Shadyside, and the owner here says he's about to put the banking system on ice. That's because he says he has his own banking system that's offering a sweet deal. About as sweet as this ice cream you see here. But I promise you, we will transform the way that banks do business. Pretty big talk coming from the owner of a little ice cream and waffle shop. 31-year-old owner Ethan Clay seems to have a chocolate chip on his shoulder. When it comes to banks, he says they held on to his credit card sales earnings for days before allowing him to transfer money into his own account. Meanwhile, his account would just melt away with overdrafts, like ice cream under a heating lamp. Over the weekend, you would have three days of your earnings. The banks would hold on to it over the weekend, and they wouldn't put it to your account until after the weekend was over. So there were some times where I could just really use some of that money. So Clay came up with an idea. Start his own little bank called Whalebone. People are invited to open an account that pays 5% interest in the form of gift cards for products in his shop. You put the money in. And once you get paid back in interest, what your initial investment is, that money no longer, you no longer have access to that money. But you can still receive interest, and that investment is now used as equity for Clay's business. And what turns on his local customers is that they can become eligible for small loans. Ryan Howard opened an account with $20 and received a $500 loan. But because you have money invested, you're eligible for a small loan. Correct. Yeah, and there was no credit check or anything. You know, he just took me on my word and we made an agreement for, you know, how I was going to pay him back. So now Clay has a shop with waffles, ice cream, and a banking system with flavor. But the State Department of Banking says Clay does not have a license or charter to do banking business. It's something the state does not like. But Clay is determined not to let this novel idea just sit and melt away anytime soon. Pretty soon, 
this is going to be the bank on the block, and we'll do whatever it takes to make this a legitimate bank. Sheldon Ingram, Channel 4 Action News. Since the airing of this video, Clay has made some semantic changes to his establishment by changing the name from Wellbank Intergalactic Cafe Bank to the less imposing Wellbank Intergalactic Cafe Banco. He has also added never-ending gift cards to replace cash deposits and replaced money loans with never-draft cash sets. He hasn't heard back from banking regulators since these changes. Now, this is a very interesting idea to me. I kind of feel like this is the way that banking used to be. It's like um, he's taking the people's money and then he's backing it with the good, in this case, ice cream. It's kind of like, it reminds me of like the gold standard where basically you can come in and collect your interest, you know, through ice cream, in store credits. I it's was very... thinking it was more along the lines of, say, the uh, Starbucks gift card or not really the Starbucks gift card, the rewards card that they have to where you can put money on it and every time you use it, you earn points. And then when you earn a certain number of points, you get a reward. Yeah, that's a great comparison as well. And it's interesting, this gentleman, um, he was charged uh, over $1,600 in fees, overdraft fees, for basically spending about $200. And so I guess he decided to find a solution to the problem. And he's out competing the banks. I mean, people like this. He's open on holidays. I mean, I would argue he's providing a better service and he's out competing them. He's definitely providing a better service. <laughs> and if I lived in Pittsburgh, I would definitely be a uh, customer of this guy. But unfortunately, I'm not in Pittsburgh, or I guess fortunately, I'm not in Pittsburgh. I'm here in Keene, New Hampshire. <laughs> unfortunately, we don't have anything like this here. So maybe one of the local businesses in Keene might get a little uh, idea and decide to open up their own intergalactic banco. Yeah, and that's um, an interesting point. Uh, one thing I was thinking as well, um, I guess going along those lines, if a local business did open their own kind of bank like that. Banco. Or Banco. <laughs> uh, this is a great case of, I mean, like, I think that banks would be smaller without all the regulations. And so maybe we would have more community banks where you would you'd get to know the people and you'd know, hey, is this guy, you know, trustworthy? Or it'd be easier to do due, due diligence and then the cost would come down. You know what I mean? Exactly, and that's one of the reasons that I prefer credit unions to banks is because they are a lot smaller. There's not the big giant mega uh, credit union the way you have the big giant mega banks that wind up being too big to fail. Yeah, and that's a great point. Well, later this evening at 10 p.m., Cheshire TV will air the broadcast premiere of Derek J's victimless crime spree, The Director's Cut. Viewer discretion is advised. Think you'll miss it? No worries. You can view it anytime at VictimlessCrimeSpree.com. I've been told no in many different ways. I give you an order and you're going to obey it. Who told you to go this way? You can do that and you have to leave here. I don't appreciate this type of behavior. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask you a question? Absolutely. Is this public property? You cannot bring signs into the rally. Walk with me. Well, I'm, I'm, no, I'm with comfortable me. here, actually. Whoa, 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 yeah, the road. Hey! Oh my god! Unbelievable! That's the bad news for you. What are you doing? What are you doing on the property? Get away from me! You're scaring me! Why are you running from me? Because you're scaring me! What am I being detained for? You're being served. What is this? What is this? Bureaucrats have a funny way of telling people no. That's the sound of the men working on the chain. Game. 
Well, uh, this is a very interesting movie. Um, you know, and it's, shot it's shot almost <laughs> entirely in Keene. There are a few scenes that are shot elsewhere. And the thing that's really interesting about this movie is that it was never intended... When Derek got here, it was never the plan to create a documentary about Derek J. It just sort of happened. So the videos that you see in the movie, they look like YouTube videos because that's what they were. They were people at these various events with their cell phone cameras or HD camera, whatever camera they had, and they were just filming on the fly. This was never intended, you know, from the beginning to be a documentary or some sort of big production. It sort of became that. Mm -hmm. So that's why some people have said the production quality isn't where they think a documentary should be, and that's because it was never intended to be that. Yeah, and to me that just shows, like, it's a more realistic uh, documentary, you know, with that quality. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. We hope you enjoyed the show. As always, if there's a story you'd like us to cover, or perhaps you'd like to make a guest appearance on the show yourself, please drop us an email at news at shiretv.org. Tune in next week for another episode of Shire TV. For more news and analysis, I'm Daryl W. Perry. And I'm James Cleveland. May you each find happiness, peace, and prosperity. I opened my door and... Oh... Mr. Eagle keeps calling me. Oh, and then I have a fox. He's very quiet. And then I got the cat out of here. And the other cat. No suitcase. Mm -hmm.